continuance of this public hearing for the um, certificate of uh, evaluation for certificate for 186 190 Summer Ave. Uh, my name is Everett Blodgett. I'm the chair. Um, just a few things before we get started. I'd like to introduce the, uh, the board um, Eileen Bornstein, Greg Manganese. Um, did I massacre that again? I'm getting, getting closer. I'm getting closer. I'll get it one of these days. Greg. Uh, Virginia Adams and Priscilla Pola. It took me about six months to get Priscilla's name mm -hmm. done. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody for coming, and I'd like to thank everybody for, for following the change from that room to this room and uh, a couple other things that have uh, taken place. Um, I'd also like to um, know that we move along in an organized fashion, that people uh, will have a chance to express their opinions and uh, there'll be input. Um, as we move along, because this is a learning process for this board, too, okay? And the quicksand is tough, okay? Um, there have been a series of about 11 or 12 letters, 11, I believe, letters that have been received. I'd like to no make note that those letters have been put on file at the town office. There has been a copy of the plan, uh, the current proposed plans of option A, option B, and option C. Uh, posted at the town office at the community services desk um, and uh, I guess that's about it to start out with. Um, I'm going to open the floor for public input uh, at this particular time and uh, see if there's any comments that would like to be expressed. Um, last meeting was a little tough because we had to take what was available. Reading's under a lot of construction under his historic buildings with the library, et cetera. <coughs> and so the room space was very short and it was not a convenient place. And we learned our lesson from that. Um, so we're going to reopen the discussion from the floor. Is there anybody that would like to make comments? Pardon? Something of new. Something new, something that they've written, something that they'd like to make sure the board has heard. Come on, folks. Uh, Ms. Binder. Um, will any of the letters be read? Or if we wrote a letter, we should present uh, that ourselves? You have your choice. If you want to read it, if not, uh, we have somebody that's offered to read them. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the recording secretary has offered to read them. <laughs> the um, may I read my own letter? You may, certainly may. Okay. My name is Angela Binda, town meeting member, precinct five. Dear Mr. Blodgett, members of the Historic District Commission, I'm writing to express my desire to see the Historic <coughs> District Commission deny the application of certificate of appropriateness for 186-190 Summer Avenue. I have seen the latest plans for the proposed criterion project, and while I appreciate the applicant's willingness to make some concessions to alter the design of the addition to make it less obtrusive, I believe the structure is not appropriate for the Summer Avenue Historic District and believe the proposed plan will alter and harm the historic neighborhood. I urge the commission to deny the applicant the certificate of appropriateness. I believe the proposed new structure and alteration to 186-190 Summer Avenue will irrevocably alter the historic and treasured character of the neighborhood. The new addition will destroy the historic nature of the neighborhood by altering and destroying the site and relationship that exists with the current National Register home and barn, the property on which it is sited, and with the surrounding properties. These relationships between the historic structures and their natural environment are key elements of the historic district. The size and scale of the proposed addition are completely out of proportion with the size and scale, other additions to the house that have been added through the years and are not in keeping with the historic house. The addition alters the view the view of the historic building from every angle, the addition of proposed alteration to the natural landscape also irreparably damaged the historic neighborhood. Over the nights of the hearing, you have heard many reasons from concerned parties wishing to protect the historic portion of Summer Avenue with its high concentration of structures on the National Register and state and local registries, and its largely unaltered broad streetscape, yards, and tranquil landscape. Neighborhoods such as this are rare and treasured, and the residents of Reading are fortunate that this neighborhood has remained largely intact and unaltered for so many years. 
The primary reason for establishing, lo sorry, that's for establishing local historic districts is to manage how change occurs in a designated area to ensure that as much of the original character as possible remains intact. Town meeting, the legislative body of the town of Reading, has endorsed the establishment of historic districts in the town of Reading and has designated a portion of Summer Avenue, including 186, 190 Summer Avenue, as a historic district in accordance with Massachusetts general law. As appointed members of the Historic District Commission, you are charged with protecting and preserving this historic neighborhood for the good of the community. The task before you is daunting, but I believe that sufficient evidence has been presented to you over the course of the continued hearing to establish that the proposal by Criterion is not suitable for the Summer Avenue Historic District and should be denied. I strongly urge you to take the long view on this matter and work your hardest to protect what the citizens of Reading have designated a historic neighborhood worthy of protection. The alterations and addition proposed by Criterion are not appropriate for this historic neighborhood. I strongly urge you to deny the requested application for certificate of appropriateness. Thank you for your long-standing and admirable service on behalf of the town of Reading. Thank you very much. Other people that would like to speak. Kathy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank the commission as well, uh, not only for the time that you spent on this issue since it's come before you, but um, also for the, process, the hearing process and the way that that's um, evolved. Um, the fact that it's been continued over three nights, I think has allowed everyone involved, including <coughs> ourselves and the applicant and the public, um, time to process the larger picture, gather facts, make revisions, and think about the issues as they relate directly to the historic district. I know that at the most recent hearing, which you've already referenced, that the um, uh, earlier in April, that it was not well attended, um, or I don't think that it was well attended. Um, and I know that I didn't speak after seeing the revisions um, presented by the applicant, and that's because I was taking time to process them, um, absorb them, and process them in the, in the larger picture. And so I'm gonna make these comments tonight that I, that I didn't make that night. Um, I also understand the full weight of the um, of your obligation to protect uh, the history and the sense of place that's provided by Summer Ave by the Summer Avenue Local Historic District. Um, I know that you're weighing the past and the importance of the history and what portion of the physical character you need to preserve to carry that history forward. Um, and you're weighing that against the present desire for change being proposed by the applicant, as well as what that's going to leave behind for the future. And I know, as Angela said in her, in her letter, that's a daunting task, and I appreciate it. Um, the question is, are the current proposed changes to the district minimal enough that they protect and preserve the character and the sense of place that's provided by the district? I think they do not. I think that the plan violates most of the features or attributes that, cont that contribute to the historic character. Um, they breach the consistency of size, scale, proportion, setting, and the landscape of the district. Um, so I would like to read excerpts from the letter that I submitted to you for consideration last week. Um, I mailed this all to you by regular mail. I trust that you received it. And I'll read. I'll try and omit some things because um, it's a little bit long, but I think that it should be read. Um, it's dated April 20th from me, Catherine Greenfield, 192 Woburn Street, um, regarding public hearing on 186 Summer Avenue to the Historic District Commission. Please consider the following information in your review of the referenced request for a certificate of appropriateness. It is my opinion that the proposed building addition and parking lot do not comply with historic preservation or rehabilitation standards, and that the request for a certificate that indicates otherwise should be denied. Excerpted below to support my opinion is material from the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties. I have specifically cited standards for rehabilitation because I believe they are the most appropriate and relevant to the proposed project. The following three terms are used in the guidelines. Rehabilitation, the act or process of making possible a compatible use for a property through repair, alterations, and additions, 
while preserving those portions or features which convey its historical, cultural, or architectural values. Building site. Building site consists of a historic building or buildings and associated landscape features. Setting. The setting is the larger area in which a historic property is located. The relationship of buildings to each other, setbacks, fences, views, driveways, walkways, and street trees together create the character of a district or neighborhood. <laughs> Within these definitions alone, the guidelines call for not only preserving those features which can convey a site's historical value, they also explicitly state that the relationship between buildings and landscape features on a site should be an integral part of planning for every work project. So I urge you to examine those features and relationships with respect to this project. <coughs> the criterion proposal does not preserve the features of the current historic setting, including its proportions, landscape features, or its relationships to other buildings. These are four rehabilitation standards that are explicit in the guidelines. One, a property will be used as it was historically or be given a new use that requires minimal change <coughs> to its distinctive materials, features, spaces, and spatial relationships. New additions will not destroy historic materials, features, and spatial relationships that characterize the property. The new work will be compatible with not only the historic materials and features, but with the size, scale, and proportion and massing to protect the integrity of the property and its environment. New additions and adjacent or related new construction which includes the parking lot, will be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the historic property and its environment would be unimpaired. The proposed changes to the property, including the changes in the spatial relationships created by the massive addition and parking lot, do not meet the above standards. They are not minimal changes, and they do destroy the spatial relationships that currently characterize the property. The scale, proportion, and massing of the addition in the parking lot are not compatible such that they protect the integrity of the property or the character of the setting. Also destroyed is the proportion of buildings, not only within the site, but also in relation to other homes in the district and to the landscape. Finally, the historic property, and in fact, the larger Sorry, setting, would, would not remain Paul unimpaired. If, it would not remain unimpaired if there was reason to reverse the proposed project in the future especially the damage caused by a parking lot. So finally, uh, the secretary standards provide the following do's and don'ts for historic rehabilitation, and they're divided into three <coughs> parts. They're do's and don'ts with respect to parking, additions, and setting. And with respect to parking, it's recommended that when designing new on-site parking, when it's required by a new use, that it is, quote, as unobtrusive as possible and assures the preservation of the historic relationship between the buildings and the landscape. What is not recommended is, quote, locating any new construction on the building site in a location which contains important landscape features or open space. For example, removing a lawn and installing a parking lot. Further not recommended is pla placing parking facilities directly adjacent to historic buildings where automobiles may cause damage to the buildings or landscape features or be intrusive to the building site. With respect to an addition, what is recommended is that when designing a new exterior addition to a historic building, that it preserves the historic relationship between the building and the landscape. What is not recommended is introducing new construction onto the building site, which is visually incompatible in terms of size and scale, among other things, and which destroys historic relationships on the site, or which damages or destroys important landscape features. And finally, with respect to setting, it is recommended that you preserve building and landscape features which are important in defining the historic character of the setting. And such features can include important views and visual relationships. It's not recommended to remove those features, and it is finally uh, recommended <coughs> that the historic relationship between buildings and landscape, um, to retain the historic relationship between buildings and landscape, and it is not recommended to destroy <coughs> those relationships. And so, um, I thank you for considering and applying these preservation standards to your review. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other comments and questions? Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we're done here. Okay. 
Um, would the applicants have anything else that they would like to add at this particular time? Well, I guess we can move the budget. Uh, we have, um, Mac Maxwell is going to be brief. We have a, a rendering which uh, slightly, slightly different perspective, not a new project, not a change in the proposal, but uh, Mr. Maxwell will describe it. And then I have some closing remarks. Good evening. Hi. We've created a new rendering, uh, much as what you saw last uh, time we were together, the beginning of April. <coughs> and what we've done at the request of the board was uh, to add the landscaping. And this landscaping is basically what has been approved by CPDC, but we've shown it um, a year or two uh, <coughs> into maturity. And we've also adjusted the image of the grade, which as we may have discussed at our last meeting, when we move the entry from the center of the addition back to the connector position, that allowed us, uh, and we've uh, worked with the civil engineer, to actually take a slight uh, increase, a rise in the grade that we had to get to that middle ramp to make it handicap accessible from the parking and the driveway. Uh, we were able to take that rise out. The site naturally uh, falls off from uh, Summer Avenue to the back of the site. It's only a few feet, but we had brought this center section up just slightly to make the grades work, and we were able to take that rise out. And so we are using the natural grade of the site. Uh, we can get our handicap accessible uh, ramp into the connector <coughs> position of the building, and then once in the connector, you can turn right into the addition and left into the historic house. That also allowed us to take the ramps off the front of the building and all the handrails, also reducing the, the mass of the building in that way. Uh, we also have taken, shaved the corner boards down. The historic house has nine, nine and a half inch corner boards. And one of the comments that we heard at our last meeting was that it felt a little heavy using the nine inch boards on the addition. So we've taken those back to be five and a half to six inches, depending on which face you're, you're on. And that lessens that corner condition. Uh, it still <coughs> replicates uh, and references the historic building, but it's a much lighter uh, look than we had before. And otherwise, we've been extremely accurate to the site plan and our proposed plan. So we've taken no liberties with the rendering to make it as accurate as it could be. Um, we, we, in fact, are preserving the existing features of the house and the barn as we have proposed all along uh, and we believe that the addition is sympathetic. And one of the other issues is that the, the mass and bulk length of the addition combined with the historic house, that that whole constellation is very similar to the property immediately to the north, so in character, and that the connected houses are all still there. And I want to remind the Commission that we have a very large lot, uh, one of the largest in the neighborhood at 71,000 square feet, uh, and that our net addition to the property is 2,869 square feet. And today there's uh, uh, someplace between 4,375 4, square feet on the site and 5,000 square feet. We're removing 1,400 square feet, and so our net addition is 2,869 square feet. The shed and connections are coming off of the property uh, are then being replaced with approximately a third of the building that we're, offer, that we're proposing is uh, replacing already built structure on the property. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Mr. Blodgett and members of the commission, I'd like to thank you for the time you have spent uh, assessing this project. Um, before I start, I need to put this right on the table. There's a gorilla in this room, and that gorilla is the fact that this commission, when it was formed, uh, the co-chair of the neighborhood group that backed the formation of this historic district said publicly, and uh, people here know it because we took a tape recording of it, sent it around, said publicly, if we can get a historic district enacted, that will cover Criterion's project. Maybe we can make it too expensive or too inconvenient for them, and they will go away. 
That's the genesis of this commission. But now we're here, and, and, and I think in some ways it's appropriate that we have Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King behind you because you do have a sacred, uh, sacred job here, not only to protect the historic district and the neighborhood, but to be fair and impartial to the applicants before you. And we ask no less than that, despite the opposition that you've heard from some of your friends and neighbors, because we're entitled to that. You are judges here. It's an absolutely sacred mission. So we ask for that impartiality, and we ask for that courage to do the right thing, despite what might be opposition to what we have here before you. So let me talk about what we put before you. First of all, I said it in the beginning, and I have to say it again. I hope you don't throw the baby out with the bath water. You know, I have, I'm not going to read it because I'm not, in, I don't really favor reading things, but there's a wonderful article called Preserving Bonds in Rural Landscapes by a Michelle Bakker, who's a member of Mass Preservation, the Preserve the Bonds initiative they have. And she writes quite eloquently about the deterioration of historic bonds in Massachusetts and the lack of money to rehab and to save them. And there's little question, little question at all, that this bond is, is history in the most literal sense, as in gone, if this project is not, uh, is not granted. Because by the time we're through uh, trying to do what we might have to do if we're denied to get our project, this bond is going to go into history. And I, I will say this, <clears throat> uh, the House may not be saved either. You know, the very first case, and, and I know uh, Mr. Miaris is familiar with it, uh, the very first case in which the Supreme Judicial Court ever ruled on a historic district was back in, I believe, 1955, when uh, a statute was passed enacting, I think it was the Nantucket Historic District. It was a statute before the Historic District Bylaw. And the legislature asked the Supreme Judicial Court if it was constitutional to have historic districts. And the SJC said, yes, it is, but there will be times when a structure is so deteriorated and will require so much money to rehab and to save that it would be unconstitutional to require a purchaser or an owner to save it and prevent them from demolishing it. So I, I respectfully believe that if criterion goes away, I'm not sure what people think is going to happen with this lot. It's a prime lot for some developer to come in, one and two thirds acres in Reading, and to purchase it. You're not going to have a family put $400,000 or more into saving these two historic structures. It's not going to happen. So if we denied, sooner or later, I think that the, the, the baby will be thrown out with the bathwater, and I think we know the bond will be gone possibly the house will be gone. And I don't think people are going to have the historic saving and salvation that they hope for. But let me address, let me address uh, Criterion's project in particular. You know, when we were here at the school uh, last, uh, what, two weeks ago? <coughs> I was walking down somewhere at three weeks ago, time flies when you're having fun. Sorry. I was, I, and I saw a sign, it, was, it, it showed the, the signs of, of the winter, it was bent over, and it said, save Kemp Place from demolition. Because that was the genesis of the fierce opposition here, the demolition permit. We, are, we have come a long way from any concern about demolition. We've come to the opposite of demolition. We've come to salvation <coughs> for these historic properties. And uh, Criterion has spent an enormous amount of not only time and money, but thought in responding to neighborhood opposition. Obviously, the opposition is in, we don't want them here. There's nothing we can do to respond to that. But in terms of, of making this addition and shrinking it significantly uh, and making it compatible, uh, that's what they have done. And, and I do want to, Mr. Blodgett, you said something which I took very seriously. I, I, I don't know if you mentioned the US Department of Interior standards and guidelines. I know some people did. But I took a careful look at them, and you were concerned about whether we were doing something wrong with allowing this size addition. And I think there's some things about these U.S. Department of Interior guidelines and standards we have to be wary of and, and aware of. First of all, uh, they say themselves that they are not legally binding on anybody 
perhaps some people that have certain federal grants, but not relevant here. They're not legally binding. Second of all, they say a number of times that they are not meant to be all-inclusive. They are not meant to cover every situation, and they, they don't cover certain exceptional or unusual situations. We also have to recognize that there are elements in those uh, uh, guidelines which have nothing to do with the Massachusetts Historic District Act or your bylaw. The guidelines talk about interiors. They talk about packing. They talk about things that you cannot take into account. When they talk about additions, they do say something that your uh, guidelines, uh, your bylaw is more explicit with, which is there's, there's no intent to freeze history, to freeze things in time so that there are no changes. And they, they say explicitly, and I don't know if it's in any of the letters, but uh, you're probably aware of it, Mr. Blodgett, because I expect that you're more expert in those guidelines than I am. They say explicitly that if the current use of a historic, they, they don't like additions. They'd rather things did not change. But we know that's not the real world. And it's certainly not the real world here. So they do say that if the current structure cannot work for a new use, they do not say there can be no new uses. They say that then an addition can be appropriate. And they do not have a maximum size for an addition. Yes, they have general language, such as your bylaw, about appropriateness of scale and massing and bulk and setting. But there is no such thing as a maximum size. So let me turn to to this project, because we've tried, there are going to be people that say, you know, that's really beautiful. Believe it or not, there may be. There are going to be people that say, we don't want criterion here because we don't <coughs> want um, uh, people dropping off the kids in the morning. And there are going to be people who say, this is too big. So we try to bring some objectivity into this process. Because without objectivity, there is no fairness. It can't happen without some objectivity. So what did we do? We first looked at the, as you may remember way back when, we looked at the, uh, the lot coverage percentage. And lo and behold, and it's not very large, it's only 24 properties, historic district, we were, I think, number 10 out of 24, meaning there were 14, I believe, properties who had larger lot uh, coverage percentages. Then uh, Mr. Meyaris said, could you do a floor area ratio analysis? And we did that. And we actually feared better in terms of the number of properties in this 24 property historic district that had uh, larger floor area ratios than we did. But I think most significantly in terms of whether this is somehow going to irreparably alter the character of this neighborhood or this street is a recognition that in these 24 properties there is the church, the only other non-residential use, and the church, of course, is larger, significantly so, than Criterion's uh, project will be. But most significantly, I just don't see how it can be ignored if we're talking about somehow altering the character of the historic district, is the very house next door. You can see it there, and you certainly can see it. You saw it on our aerials, and you can certainly see it walking down the street. The house next door. Now that we've shrunk this addition uh, significantly, the house next door is larger. It's longer. It's more impactful on its lot. It's more impactful on the street. So to, unless we're going to be in the business of saying that this is a plebiscite and we've gotten 15 letters that don't want you and no letters or one letter that do want you, unless we're going to be in the business of saying this is a plebiscite, and of course that would not be proper, by all objective measures, by any fear measures, we are not out of character, certainly not oversized with a lot, and not out of character with this neighborhood. We feel that, that given the time and effort that we've spent, and one last thing, yes, this is a change, because there was an addition here, but it was smaller. <coughs> However, we're talking, remember, about the, uh, I think Kemp Place was described as having, uh, being a fine example of Italian architecture, uh, so also with the barn. Well, take Criterion away. There's your Italian and architecture. It's going to be gone. With this proposal, here's the Italian and architecture. Absolutely visible. Not only will it remain visible, but it's going to be saved 
It's going to be rehabbed. It's going to be made more beautiful and restored. And here's the Italian architecture in the barn. Same thing. It's going to be saved. It's going to be rehabbed and restored. And these architectural features are going to be visible from the public way, not only for now, but for future generations. Uh, respectfully, people, I, I think we've earned the right for your vote, despite the opposition from some in the neighborhood. We need three of your votes. I, I, I pray we get all five. I think we've earned it. And uh, thank you. Yeah, I just want to comment on uh, Mr. Mark Owen's um, comments about the gorilla in the room. Um, because um, um, the integrity of this group and the integrity of the town meeting and the integrity of the town um, should not be so um, cavalierly uh, addressed. So Mr. Margolin raised the same argument uh, when he <coughs> uh, requested the Attorney General to disapprove our uh, amendment to the Historic District Bylaw. And um, I responded at that time, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to read you what I wrote. Mr. Margolin has provided a short audio excerpt from the September 8, 2014 meeting of the 01867 Neighborhood Preservation Group in which one individual states that she hopes the creation of the historic district will cause Criterion to abandon its deal with the property owner, or that it will, quote, make their life more difficult and expensive, unquote. These comments demonstrate only the speaker's desire to prevent Criterion from demolishing an historic property. They do not remotely suggest an improper motive. Moreover, the statements selected by Mr. Margolin mm -hmm. have been cherry-picked from a video in which the pres presenters repeatedly state that the group's intent is to preserve the property and that they are working to suggest acceptable alternatives to criterion. For example, in a portion of the video that Mr. Margolin chose not to provide, the same speaker <coughs> expressed her understanding that a historic district bylaw cannot be used to regulate the use of the property and that the proposed bylaw would give the town more control to preserve the property, including potentially preventing demolition of the building. 01867 Community Preservation Meeting said, uh, September 8, 2014. We have the video. Anyone um, uh, wants to look at it? Uh, it's not in the record of this proceeding, but, um, uh, but it is available as a public record. Taken as a whole, the video demonstrates clearly that the speaker had knowledge of the scope of allowable regulation of the District Districts Act and was primarily motivated by a desire to preserve the property. In the same video, another presenter states, that part of the organization's purpose is to identify alternative locations inside Reading for Criterion. She then states that we welcome Criterion to Reading, but not <coughs> at the cost of destroying the rich historic nature of the neighborhood and the historic buildings that are there. The presenter describes Criterion as providing developmental services that are needed, and we have no issue with that. These comments strongly suggest that preservation is the group's primary motive, and that opposition to Criterion is based on its proposal to establish <coughs> the buildings, nothing more. Throughout the video, other speakers may be heard expressing a variety of opinions about Criterion and the Historic District, including comments that suggest personal opposition on grounds that Criterion is commercial, that it would build a large parking lot that would adversely impact the neighborhood, that it could sell the property to a for-profit for entity, and on a variety of other grounds. The comments reflect a wide range and demonstrate that no single motivation has been attributed to the group, much less to the town meeting that enacted the bylaw. The mm -hmm. debate at town meeting further undermines any allegation of improper motive. Town meeting members discussed the bylaw for approximately 40 minutes before voting on it. <coughs> Speakers again demonstrated the understanding the proposed bylaw regulated limited external features and could not be used to regulate property use. Although <coughs> criterion was mentioned, discussion was narrowly focused on preserving the historic buildings in the neighborhood. The debate at town meeting demonstrates that the voting members who adopted the bylaw were primarily concerned with preserving the historic character of the neighborhood. So I'd like to register my um, exception to the idea that there is somehow an improper motive behind the uh, creation of the historic district bylaw uh, or uh, the need for this particular procedure. Let me make absolutely clear I did not 
challenge or insult the integrity of U5. If, if that impression was given, my apologies, that was not the intention at all. So let's put that on the record. Uh, Dr. Littleton uh, has, has told me that he, I can represent if there's any concern about the sincerity of saving the ban, that he would accept as a condition that the exterior rehab would be done immediately as opposed to some indefinite time in the future. Um, I'm not nervous, I'm just a little apprehensive about the fact that this is the first I've heard, I knew that there was some underground rock. I didn't know there was a video, I didn't know there was anything really of the same nature. I would like to speak to the fact of the honor of this board has been 100% crisp in, first of all, setting up the historic district. We felt that that's something that should have been done a long time ago, mm -hmm. and they worked incredibly hard with the support of some people to um, make that happen and make it happen within the confines of what I think was the law. Um, and I think this board is very, I don't know if I'm honest, incredible about spending the time and the energy to look at and try and say, how does the past connect not to the present, but to the future? <coughs> and I think that's where I'm coming from. Um, I don't know when it's appropriate, but the old teacher of 11 years ago is coming out in me. And it probably won't be as good because I, I get nervous about these things. But I got doing kid stuff, and I drew that the scale as best I could because I wanted to have a feeling. I am one of the people that brought up the Department of the Interior. Because the Department of the Interior has worked on what I consider three categories. One is national parks. And look at the national parks. Go look at Minutemen. They're building there that are the historic that have been pristinely restored. Granted, sometimes at our expense, <laughs> and sometimes at somebody's individual's expense, and they had the land to do it. Okay? But the point is that when they built a building in there that was going to be for another purpose, they didn't attach it to one of the historics. And I'm just looking at this category right now of national parks and the fact that um, they picked a way away from in the woods, the parking is away in the woods so that it doesn't ruin the setting. That impresses me. I think they've done a great job. I just got back from Appomattox Courthouse. And I saw Appomattox Courthouse that burned and was restored in pristine condition with the interior made entirely compatible, excellent service for the visitor center. But the outside is pristine integrity. Uh, it's a small place. Not one that we have an addition on. It's a different one, but it's on the national parks. So I have to realize that. Then they give some of us homeowners, I am one of them, my wife is one of them, uh, the characteristic of um, National Register. Nice piece of paper, folks. It doesn't do one thing for us. No. Yeah, maybe this ten million dollars in grants that are available. All the money on it for not one in red and that ever got a pen. Okay. But that's a different category. There's no restrictions. But then they also have this uh, thing called uh, historic districts. Um, I'm kind of trying to speak for myself and trying to educate myself at the same time that this is where I really am at. The, Nash, the uh, historic districts falls a lot different. It's the local rules being established. What the local decides. It's we the people speaking instead of I want this and I want that. It's, it's what town meeting wants. That's what they passed. 144 to 4 I think was the vote. Okay. Um, <coughs> So it's a way of us trying to protect what we consider our treasures and how much we can have them violated or not violated to represent the past. The past would be wonderful. The original Mansfield Father Kemp State was 10 acres up there. You can't find much of it now. Okay? So there's a, this openness <coughs> that we really want to look at at some particular point. Um, the Reading Bylaw specifically four times mentions mass, scale, uh, bulk, proportion. But it doesn't do them independently. It ties them to something. It ties them to another building, or to the setting, or to the land. So it's how do they fit in relationship to those proportions. And I think that's where I'd 
begin to have a little bit of trouble. Um, my thinking about the stick on it. This is 186 out of the big three pot. Well, somewhat divided at some particular point. And then I see if I can get this on my face. I see you shaking here, folks. I'm excited, nervous, whatever it might be. That addition is 1.34 times larger than the saved historic building. It's huge. It's massive. Can we tolerate it? That's the question. And you made these people over here responsible to do that, to make a wise decision about that. Part of what's the Sorry, I've got the floor. Now I'm going to take it for five to ten minutes if I need it. Part of what presents the problem is the pro and con of the open space. 9.6%. Wonderful. But it presents the major problem. It leaves all this section uh, to this section open. So anybody on the southwest and all this section open because of the uh, Drake property on the other side, all this side opens, so that becomes totally visible. That's tough. You know, this one down here isn't totally visible. You can't see it from there, you can't see it from there. And you can't see it from the front. Okay? So this open site right here presents a unique situation for this property, for this property, for this property, for this property, from behind this property, for here. Uh, I don't think so much here anymore. Okay? Those are open sites. I don't know that this is precedent setting, but if this does happen, what? prevents some other owner from saying, I want my rights too to make my property a four condo property. I'm concerned about that. I'm very concerned about that. Um, I wrote down, there's an after thought, it's not about filling the empty spaces or compromising the filling the empty spaces. It's a big part of keeping this district. So there has a <coughs> um, under a different category of the category of what the town has already in terms of historic buildings, I would like to look at town hall. And the connector that connects this to the old library, some of us remember the old library. I don't specifically like the connector, okay? But it joins in a discreet way without becoming the dominant feature of the property. These two buildings, so it makes it very usable, okay? Look at the MF Charles building that's recently being completed. You can see that from the Haven Street side and the Main Street side. It's unbelievable. And yet it has an addition in the back okay, of an entrance and a um, stairway elevator in that area that doesn't violate the, the property at all. It's totally, it doesn't take them in, it doesn't take command of the property. Um, and the difficulty I have is these examples are not in the historic district. The historic district supposedly has greater control. The removal of 690 square foot footprint of the breezeway in the shed will leave a gap that will be overfilled by 2,137 square foot two-story additions. That's over three times larger than the addition that's there now. That's huge. It's just absolutely huge. And I have problems with that. And I, I'm upset with a statement that was made very early in Bowen that the new addition would not, would not, absolutely would not, would be subservient to the historical building. 1.34 times larger. Just it's just, it's just way old. Those are my feelings. Uh, I want the board to look at it. I want the board to look strongly at it and uh, make the decision which is right for them. After, after it's born, if I may. Somebody else yes. has the floor before you. Okay. Somebody else Thank has the floor before you. Everett, um, I'd like to talk about the little sticky that you put on because I couldn't make it to the last meeting, but um, I did watch the whole thing video and I did hear you specifically say that you were concerned about the bulk of the addition and every time I, I hear that 
note, I want to really point out that all the people in the room are in the 01867 Neighborhood Preservation, that when you keep saying this bulk is that big, I think you need to say that it's not that big when you realize the existing house is all of this material. And I never hear you say that the existing property that's pretty much falling apart, do you want them to keep that and only put this much on? That doesn't make sense. When they really need four classrooms, so this massive addition that you keep talking about, you never say, but they are removing a part that's <coughs> not historical, that's not original, and that really is part of this bulk. I really resent how much you keep saying bulk when part of that is already existing in bad shape. Second of all, I want to address a comment that Mr. Margulies had made about a giraffe or an elephant or whatever it was in the room. You're not aware of it, Mr. Town Council, but this 01867 Neighborhood Preservation Group has been going pretty strong since. <coughs> Mr. I mean, Chairman, may I interrupt on point of personal privilege, please? I'm afraid this um, hearing is getting a little bit more personal and we should keep this wide open. That's and not personal. I'm sorry. Um, and I think it's important for us to be deliberating in a positive manner. And I ask everyone to refrain from making personal accusations. Thank you. Excuse me, but I want to clarify that's not a personal uh, accusation. I, I played the whole video of that meeting that I could not attend. And I am just quoting what Mr. Blodgett said. So that's not personal, that is just spitting back out that I think those kind of comments aren't fair to continue to say to this group how much it, it, it concerns him of the bulk when it's really not all that bulk. Second of all, I wanted to address... And that's the point I would like to make. No comments should be being addressed to me. I'm not the recipient of comments. If you have right comments here. for the board. Right here. Oh, okay. Thank well, you. I was re re commenting to you because you were rebutting what Mr. Margaret said. All comments should go to the chair, not to me. Okay. Everett. You weren't involved in the group, I don't believe, in the beginning, but the O N A six and P group um, started underground and they started going. And when the comments were made that people didn't want this and they were doing things, truly, I got an email from one of the people who joined the group. I'm sorry again, but what does this have about this project that we're? I can't. I guess tonight? I can't finish it, Virginia. I can't tell you what it has to do with the project if I can't finish my comment. Well, I don't know how any of the activities of 01867 have influenced this board. We've been very careful to keep our distance from that, and we remain to do so. Okay. If that's what you're saying, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. um, The chair would like to make a comment that my remarks are made, because if that addition is put up as the uh, remark on asphalt proportion, that's what we have to live with in generations forever. That's the only reason. I'm fully aware that this, and I said it, this 690 feet that are coming off, the 2,137 that are going on. That's the square foot footprint, and that's exactly what I said. So I'm fully aware of it, and I will wear that. Mr. Blodgett, may I? I'm uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Well, I just wanted to, to respond to two comments you made, because I think they're, they're important. <coughs> you, you worry, and you said this before, and I don't, I don't disregard your concern. You said you worry about precedent. First of all, I, we have to remind our, uh, ourselves that in terms of what can go into this neighborhood, zoning bylaw applies. The only reason that criterion is here as a non-residential use is because it has a legal right to. But the only <coughs> other uses that can go into this neighborhood are residential, unless it's uh, something protected by the Dover Amendment. So in terms of that fear of a multifamily or something huge like that, this being a precedent, I think the zoning bylaw protects against that. But secondly, your bylaw does say that these analyses should be case by case, lot by lot, in the context of the neighborhood. But there is no precedent here that somebody can waive this and then come in and do what they want. That's not the way it works. And respectfully, it's, I don't think it's a concern this board needs to have. 
how I feel. Um, I just wanted to say that um, in reference to the bulk and mass and footprint and visibility, uh, it is within the purview of this commission to decide on that through the general bylaws that we have, through the rules and regs, and through the guidelines. Uh, several concerns I'd like to raise um, tonight before we come to a vote or even make motions. And that would be, um, I'd like to ask town council, the advisability of introducing preservation restrictions on this property um, that would be filed with the um, Massachusetts Historical Commission and probably enacted by uh, held by the Reading Historical Commission. The commission already holds four preservation restrictions. There are deed restrictions that um, can be written to um, protect certain elements <coughs> of the structure. They could um, help for the future uh, and any changes of activity in it. That they would, and certain maintenance and repair would have to be done, and the um, overseeing entity that would uh, hold these restrictions, which is ultimately the town of Reading, that the, quite often they have a review procedure where they can go in every five years to um, check out the property to make sure that it's being well maintained. and. Uh, that runs in perpetuity with the land. And I think that might be uh, an appropriate thing for us to consider um, is another means of helping to protect the historic structure. I have a copy of one that uh, we hold on a property here in town if you want to review it. <laughs> well, probably not right this instant. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but we certainly drafted a number of similar um, historic district, uh, historic uh, preservation restrictions uh, uh, for buildings. Um, the, I, I'd be interested to hear whether um, um, the applicant would uh, agree to execute such a restriction as a condition of, of a certificate of appropriateness. Um, yes. uh, many of the uh, requirements that you would put into such a restriction could be written as uh, conditions to the permit, but as you pointed out, a, a deed restriction uh, of that sort has the uh, advantage that it is um, in perpetuity and can't be um, uh, amended by, say, a future historic um, district commission that, that um, took a different view. Uh, so it, it, it is more uh, permanent, um, and um, so it's certainly a, a, a worthwhile approach if you decide that um, that you want to condition um, a certificate of appropriateness on the execution of a uh, historic preservation restriction. Uh, then we would need to get to work on drafting that. Um. I'm told by my client that would be acceptable. There probably needs some work involved. Yeah, sure. you don't have a draft. No, I understand. Yeah. Of course, we'd want to. See, we would want to see the language, but the concept is acceptable. Mm -hmm. <coughs> by the way, as the rest of my teaching lesson, I would like to point out that I'm fully, fully, and I think the board's very aware of the great deal of concern about preserving this building, and that's where the how the conflict comes because now, never, when. You know, it's it's a it's a tough bind if you put it in. And I, I want to make make sure that the board's aware of that. That's why we spent the time to go through this and um, <coughs> trying to figure out where we belong in that relationship. <coughs> also noting that Reading's lost two of the Sperry House was an Italian eight and the uh, the Mayu property was Italian eight. Uh, we've lost them and there aren't many left in Reading. Out of the frame, you know. <coughs> um, <coughs> 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 I'm going to go into the town of Green Hill. 
<coughs> you're right. <coughs> this is really a really, really opinion or a pertinent uh, Yes, we can keep going. Uh, yeah, sorry. What? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, Pete Shields from uh, Randall Road. In the beginning of the meeting tonight, uh, you made reference to a number of letters, like 15 or something, and we heard two of them. I can't help but think there's other views that weren't expressed there uh, between these two that might uh, help people if they heard the other letters. You well, have it had help in terms of helping the board or helping out there. The board has received all the letters. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, received them. In fact, they only came in in the last two days uh, after the previous account there. And so they were delivered to their. their uh, then it would be for the audience. Yeah. Um, I, I will have some very kind of consuming talk. We're not here to entertain the audience, we're here to get the information. So that's the way I feel. Um, Mary Ellen O'Neill, I also live on Summer Avenue. Oh, I thought that you were able to take a look also in terms of the um, setting. So what I find, while this you know it looks more appealing with the landscaping and the and the um, trees and whatever, it still to me presents a disingenuous look at how this will actually impact the property, as it doesn't indicate where the parking will be along the addition. Uh, the signage that will be there. We're not getting a true look, and I don't even see where they've set those parking spaces. As you know, they need quite a few. So we're not getting a true picture um, in this picture of what's actually going to happen on the property. Um, and, and I think that needs to be taken into consideration. It was part of my notes, too, but I didn't say it. <laughs> Yes, uh, Mr. Blodgett, I just wanted to thank the board for the time and effort that, that has been put into this review. The town of Reading and its citizens have made, um, committed substantial time and, and careful thought to reviewing this proposal. And I, and I personally uh, take no exception to the fact that this has taken the type of time and effort on our behalf that's been expended. I do hope you have <coughs> sensed our sincerity to try and accommodate the um, kind of reasonable uh, requests and uh, opinions that people have raised within the limitations of our mission and our need to serve the, the thousands of families uh, from this area that we have served over these past years. I would just like to add one uh, specific assurance, you know, not only as the founder in, of the organization and the person responsible for its development over these many years, but just uh, uh, as I authorized uh, council to do, uh, we'd be more than happy to accept a, a, a deed restriction. So, you know, I, I hope to live forever, <laughs> but should I not, uh, that there's no question that the sincerity intended by me and our organization to recognize the historic value of the house is protected. I think the board would like to do some conversation amongst itself and do some deliberation here and see if we can come up with what we feel we is the next step, what we want to do. Um. I think we should note that we did receive some um, materials from uh, the applicant's attorney uh, for a determination of um, applicability and we have received uh, draft material from town council for uh, different approaches. So he's even saying something. So the chair will 
set this. I've already done some discussing, so I think I'm kind of going to sit back here for a second and see if uh, we can moderate between us. We have any uh, questions we have asked to get information. There's a lady back there. Yeah. Um, this is Loopy. Ah. <laughs> Thank, Thank, Thank you, Mr. Blodgett. I just would like to um, make a, a, ask a question, a general question. Um, considering the fact that maybe the uh, historic value might be preserved, which is still, you know, debatable, um, I think there are several of us that are concerned about our property values and with respect to the prospect of selling them. And um, perhaps even a, a, a further a decrease in assessment. Um, we'd like to have maybe Mr. Margolin, who has represented Mr. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Dr. Dr. Criterion. Yes, Criterion as well. Um, I just would like <coughs> to um, wonder what he would do if he were living as in a butter or within view of the property. I'd be happy to comment. I can answer I'd be happy to comment. I mean, uh, very uh, honestly, uh, I'm sorry. If you want to recognize me, I'd be happy to comment. I'd be happy to live next to a property that was going to be improved and maintained to this level. And in, in all due respect to the years of hard work the current owner has put into a maintaining a property of this size, you all have had the opportunity to see this property in short. It is not possible in this day and age within the resources uh, and appraised values present in that neighborhood to bring this property back and maintain it in the splendor that it would be maintained by our nonprofit, but yet um, commercial entity in the sense that we provide services for the public. And, and, and since I was called upon by name, I know it's not part of the legal standard, but I, I don't mind responding <coughs> to any question. In fact, on my street at Grove Hill Avenue in Newton, which is not in historic district, but across the street was a gorgeous old, I think it was a federal, but don't quote me, and um, it was pr and it was in rough shape. A woman who lived there was 96 and she died, and it was purchased by a developer and literally made two and a half times the size, but gorgeous and undoubtedly enhanced my property value. Around the corner from me is a group home for adults with mental disabilities. I have no problem at all. <coughs> for what it's worth. So let's well, channel, no, I'm, let's channel let's try to keep us. We're going to have some discussion up here, and maybe we'll open it up later, but we need to have some discussion up here. I had another question. Um, I'd like to review the, the different the scenarios, the different possibilities after um, going through this process and um, I was going to use the analogy of an elephant in the room, but I guess we've done enough with the animals. <laughs> so, um, I understand that we can vote for a certificate of appropriateness, we can deny a certificate of appropriateness, the applicant can then apply for a certificate of hardship and if that is denied, the applicant has the right to uh, go before an arbitrator set up by the Mass uh, MAPC, and if he is further aggrieved after that, um, that's in our bylaw number something, 7.3 something. Um, and then if the applicant is still aggrieved, um, oh, I should go back one step. The arbitrator makes the decision for the community, and that sole person will make the decision. And is that what we want to have happen? If not, and if they're still aggrieved, they can go to uh, the courts, and um, then all our testimony and all our um, records will be uh, introduced, and a decision will be made by the courts. So I have to think. I believe the board has to think about whether you want to have Reading make the decision, you want to have an arbitrator make the decision, or you want the court to make the de decision. That makes our shoulders a little heavier. Mm -hmm. Other comments, questions? Right. Uh, how's that feel now? <laughs> <laughs> we have two choices, basically, right up front. 
a certificate of appropriateness. We may attach some strings or some conversation about that. Right. We have, um, I guess, uh, a denial of a certificate of appropriateness. Mm -hmm. um, where there are less strings, but then they have some possible choices under the bylaw 7.3 point, 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 whatever it is. Um, they then can apply for a certificate of uh, hardship, which I believe falls basically into two categories. One is financial and the other is other. Um, um, we would give them time to prepare for that and come in and give us new information that says this is why it's a hardship. I don't believe we have all the information that they would want us to have at this point. Uh, or they can uh, ask for an appeal hearing which goes through MAPC, Metropolitan Area Planning Commission. Area Planning Commission. Um, and they don't, that commission does not make the decision. They appoint someone to be the arbitrator, yes. the way I read the dialogue. That's yes. And they make a decision. Uh, I guess I would question the decision since the board doesn't really know this. Did they make a decision on, did we do everything properly and therefore we made the decision we wanted to do? Or would they say, no, I like a 17 story building there and they can put up what I want, you know? Or can they change the ball game? Um, okay, well the arbitrator is reviewing your decision and reviewing the application. Really. Um, uh, I would say that the application and decision frame what the arbitrator can, <coughs> um, can consider. So, so no, the arbitrator can't say, um, uh, I, like this. I like some other building. Um, uh, but the, the, the statute is a little um, incomplete, shall we say, about um, exactly how the, what the arbitrator can consider. Uh, but um, the um, um, I would imagine that uh, the arbitrator would treat this somewhat like the, uh, the process that is now in the zoning field. That is, they bring in all the new evidence, and this time there's cross examination of witnesses and, and uh, conducted more or less like a trial. But they would, there would be new findings of that made at that point. As far as the scope of the arbitration, that's pretty much bounded by what is, what's in the application. And, and what's in the Will you say the application or what we've agreed upon up to a certain point? Otherwise, there's a lot of, and I, I point this up to right here and, and down, they've, they've made a lot of agreements, both with this board and with the historical commission and the zoning and stuff like that along the way. So is it brought up to that point? Automatically, is that what they're looking at, or are they going to go back and start at scratch one with the application? Do you understand what I'm asking? Are you asking, since the original application was for a bigger building, okay. and then later they came back and with them, with them, uh, they proposed to reduce the size of the building, um, would they be able, as part of their appeal, to go back and, and um, seek the bigger building? And the answer is yes. May I? Okay. I guess I have my answer that I didn't want. Okay. <laughs> now they may tell you that they won't do it, uh, but, but as far as the matter of their legal right, they 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 would be entitled. Okay. All hopeful. Any other comments or questions? Discussion amongst us? Irene, you have some questions? I did, but um, most of them were regarding position as a taxpayer <laughs> and the removal of a large piece of property from the, uh, the tax roll. That is a historic district commissioner. We have uh, pretty limited as what we believe we just discuss.
for a certificate of appropriateness submitted by Criterion, page 6 of 11. <coughs> Number 22. Um. 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 Historic bond to collect the bonds, uh, to protect the bonds uh, structurally at some point. It's in uh, a decision to found is this a rewrite? It is a rewrite. And I do have another question. Mr. Blodgett? Yes. Um, I, I have what you're referring to. When we did say in the proposed decision that the stabilization preserving of the bond would be at some point in the future, but Dr. Littleton represented and I represented on his behalf, Criterion's behalf tonight, that we would accept as a condition of stabilizing and restoring the exterior of the bond promptly, now essentially, not, not within 15 years. So that would be a, a change in paragraph 22. Okay. Okay. Um, from that same document, page 11, Conditions, uh, actually, it's the last page, 11 of 11. All work on the existing historic house, existing barn, and the new addition shall substantially conform to the architectural plan submitted. Um, what does substantially mean? Almost. Yeah, that, that, that puzzles me and um, troubles me, substantially. I, I can explain the genesis, but I mean, first of all, we do understand that if you approve the certificate, you will draft the language as you want. But the notion was not to say wink and a nod, we won't really. The notion was sometimes during construction, things occur. Mm -hmm. So, but so there was, it, it's fairly standard language. There's no intention to back off of the commitments. But it's fairly traditional language, but obviously, if you approve the certificate, the language is going to be yours, not ours. This was to be helpful. And I do want the record to say that we are we're discussing predominant option A here. That's what we decided at the last meeting was um, the movement was about option A. There are three options, A, B, and C, like the video. So the net result is that's just <laughs> with, uh, less trim and less ornateness and not a flat roof like C. Um, so it's option A of the facility. So let me, let me elaborate on substantial for you. Um, it's not, in most circumstances, possible um, to um, make every detail of, uh, of the work 100% to uh, plans. You get out there, things happen. You certainly don't want to be in the business There, give a little bit of wiggle room so that so that um, uh, people can uh, make reasonable decisions, and you don't have to uh, hold a hearing uh, every uh, other week to uh, uh, to oversee what goes on. Um, um, I would say that any deviation that alters the perception of the property. Pretty much means you know minor and, and insignificant. And if you um, um, uh, so, if there's something that is going to be noticeable, you know, to to somebody from the street. That's different from the plan. That's a little tiny things are almost certainly going to happen. And also to point out, and if it's a certificate of appropriateness, that if they do have change, that they have to notify us, and then we can decide whether. To Mm -hmm. um, again, um, I think it's who has 
has enough knowledge to really challenge a lot of these things or understand a lot of them. I think this is what I'm really saying. Okay. This computer of appropriateness does have that in it. application uh, submitted by Criterion for 186 to 190 Summer Avenue uh, be denied. Do I have a second? Yes, sir. Okay. Right, well, now I'd like to have some discussion about that. Anybody would like to discuss? I think we talk so much about uh, the size and the bulk and the massing, um, and that's uh, probably the basis for this uh, denial. Um, it would certainly be my. Um, I appreciate the fact that there's a lot of uh, effort for historic preservation, and I hope that can continue. Um, that perhaps if we have to consider. Uh, certificate of hardship, we could uh, show some uh, flexibility uh, in that, or some encouragement. But I think we have to make the strong statement that this is inappropriate for the district, and uh, do I have to go into all the specifics that are in the bylaw that say why that's the case? It would be good. <laughs> well, we will, I think we will eventually have to. I don't know if we have to do it. I do have to. Are you going to let you have some support here? Yes. Um, I, I would like to support that motion. And uh, I do indeed have some references within the guidelines Good. when the time comes for that. If this is now, then I can't yeah, find them. <laughs> Great comments. Uh, overall setting. In the landscape and the historic district and preserving the historic district, I don't feel like being met with the, the plan. It's not appropriate for this district. I guess I said something to my wife today. She said I should save it till later. I'm not sure. You mean tomorrow? <laughs> well, I, I don't think our district fits your needs, and that's the problem. The problem is changing the district to fit your needs makes the incompatibility, it makes the violations much more flagrant. If we had a large building that would hold that, that's a doable. It's it's not a problem. But the problem is we don't have that. The size, the mass, the bulk, the setting that you need. And that's the unfortunate part about it. It's not the service. Well, I'm assuming you're speaking to me. So I'm assuming I have a right to respond. Well, yes. But you I want you to understand what I'm saying. Oh, I understand, I understand because fully. I, where, where my problem, and I'll speak well, personally. Well, districts can't change easily mm -hmm. to become what the applicant wants. And I think that's the problem. Life. life doesn't change easily in life this is there this is no longer summer street is no longer a cart path you know it, it doesn't reflect the top the street itself is paved it does not reflect the, the the nature and character of its grandeur of a day gone by and with all due respect to the people in the neighborhood 50 percent of those homes are vinyl sided you know so to suggest that somehow the time and effort that's going to be put into preserving this with a historically appropriate materials is somehow not up to the standards of the neighborhood 
I'm sorry, if I may, you, you may be calm. You know, I, I don't believe to be accurate. Further, un unless you're going to suggest there should be no church in that neighborhood, there should be no school in that neighborhood or otherwise, which I don't think you'd ever suggest, I do think there's an element of discrimination going on here. And I, and I, I feel badly about that, but it is something that I was, as a person put on this earth to help defend and will pursue to the full lengths. I'm sorry that, you know, it, it hasn't worked out the way people would like. We've made our very best effort uh, to have it work out. But I do think people, there's been a bit of a mob mentality and in, in that has played out off, off public grounds, as we all know, in a very explicit way. And it's unfortunate, but I think it's under the surface. It's carried out in a number of ways. And in, in my, my concern is that I'm certainly not going to stop here and, and condone that, and, and nor am I going to ignore the discrepancies in the fair treatment of this property relative to, say, a church or a school uh, and, and other protected properties. So, I mean, I, I, and I do honestly believe that people are trying to fight through and, and do, do what's right, and I understand that. I, I don't doubt anyone's motives, but I do think there hasn't been a good balancing of the, the realities of the modern era versus uh, in, in the attempts to preserve the best parts of our tradition, traditions under the, pres the pressures of the present contingencies, both from uh, a societal obligation to serve and from the obvious discrepancies as it relates to, you know, modern convenience of, of travel and otherwise. So I'll just leave it at that. Well, I do have some problems with the school is out of the district. It's not really the community. The church is not. And, yeah, and the, I do appreciate the fact that this was open. And the house next door is district. bigger. I mean, you, 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 I, we've all said it, I think, at this point, and I appreciate that. I, I think it's important that we're still on the, the auspices of discussion. We don't know how that holds going to go right. on this motion. So I, I hope people uh, can bear with us for a bit. Um, and I would uh, be amenable to allowing a uh, application for hardship uh, if <coughs> because of the previous letters have always asked for it and I would uh, probably allow that they would not have to rehear or repost it um, even though that original legal notice is for a certificate of appropriateness and I guess we could ask the uh, town council um, what status, how complicated would that be? Have you noticed it? Um, I believe we agreed in our procedural uh, memorandum that the, that the hearing would in fact be renewed. Mm -hmm. yes. So, um, um, <coughs> so there's no question that it has been uh, the, the, the agreement, the procedural agreement that uh, the council uh, and I entered into states that if you um, <coughs> determine to deny a certificate of appropriateness, that you won't file the decision. They won't. Um, uh, they won't object to it being filed late. They will. Uh, there will be a new notice, and there will be a new hearing on appropriateness. Uh, it, it makes sense to make sure that everybody knows that we've gone to the second to the second stage. So. Um, so the agreement is that you would, you would go through all of the same procedures for noticing the, uh, the second part of the hearing as you did for the original. And, and Mr. Blodgett, um, the agreement between Mr. Miaris and, and I on behalf of our clients, it would be, if, if the vote goes negative tonight, it would be a hearing on our application for a certificate of hardship and our request for reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. said, and I don't know if it's the exact words about um, the historic district, it's going to take a, this is too quick of a change for the, the historic district in terms of the, the addition and the size for people to accept it, you know, it's moving fast. But I also want to point out that the historic district is relatively new as of town meeting, and it only, it wasn't something that was on the agenda before criteria 
came onto the scene and all the meetings we had. So that historic district was really brought about by people who did not want this at all. Because if it, they weren't buying it or a, a petition to actually... I have to, I have to think of yeah. the character of people who say they really want to do it. No, I know, I'm saying, but the historic district was not yeah, even that considered... Put on the radar for people, and that's... That's, that's right. Thing. Point of information. Yes. Were there going to be some reasons provided for the vote so that's on the record? Um, we have a whole series I don't know that I have enough for everybody, so basically, I think it's kind of what is, what is that? Uh, this is the draft. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. We should probably know which one we're handing out here first. The draft, yes, which one are you handing out? Neither one. The one that goes with the motion. The one that goes with the motion, right? Actually, I'd like to go through um, some of these points, too. Absolutely. as an early intervention program for infants and toddlers. An historical bond on the site is proposed to be stabilized and reserved for future renovations. An existing 800 square foot addition to the historical house is proposed to be demolished and replaced with a new addition to be connected with the historical house by means of a new brick <coughs> and a vestibule. And then, um, if we're on the same page, um, one correction on uh, number four, the existing addition and an existing breezeway connecting to the addition to the historical house were later additions that have strike no and put little, because all additions have some historical significance. Got it. <coughs> Yeah, that's what I... 
Where? In number 19, the applicant had proposed a new. Is that for the most I recent one, or is this relation that's, to that's, the, that's the, the old one? The old one. No, these numbers are different. So, past tense would be fine. Right. Right. The, the correct number. Sounds like it should be had. The, for number 19, the yeah. correct numbers would now be uh, 2007 per floor. But I think this is all talking about the first proposal. Got it. Yeah. See on number um, number twenty three, it says at the end of the evening the hearing remained open and the second time is scheduled for yep. April yeah. second, two thousand fourteen. At the end of the section on the revised proposal, it does not say at the end of the evening the hearing remained open and the third night was scheduled for. So, just for the record, that um, we consider option A to be the most appropriate. Say that again. Uh, 28 is quite correct, but I just wanted to emphasize that it's option A for the public knows that's worth it to have 29 in there or not because the original uh, application is now null and void because they've come in with a new one. Does this help us keep a basis? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, 29. I had problems. I finally figured out 604 and 593. 593 is a negative number. It's made, yeah, 596, because it says smaller. And that adds up to 1,200 square feet. It's a, a diff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know where the 87 comes from. I can't, I can't clarify that. Can anybody straighten me out on that one? <laughs> So many of the numbers are uh, determined on what you come from, too, you know, and going. So it's, it's not the number, it's how did you get to the numbers, mm -hmm. really, the problem here. So that number is computed by taking the percentage 
taking the um, uh, the square footage of the reduced proposal, <coughs> comparing it to the square footage of the structures that as they exist today. As they exist today. The problem being one of them is to have the barn in and the other one didn't seem to have the barn in. So they're not done from the same basis. Well, I apologize if one and a half is wrong. Um, um, so that presents a problem. I don't know how to figure it out. But I haven't played it all yet. We certainly want to give a comparison just to the house and one comparison to the entire property. So you're looking at uh, two different relations to the Right. Maybe it would be better to find <laughs> <laughs> I, it, May I make a comment or no? But, but sure. Related to what you're talking about. The, uh, the, this is our proposal before you, and it will be for certificate of uh, hardship and ADA, but if we are on appeal, as, as Mr. Mayaris stated, the uh, original proposal is not null and void, uh, nor is the request to demolish the building null and void on appeal. I just want to make sure that, that we're clear on that. On appeal to what? To the MAPC. <coughs> the MAPC. Before you, before you, this is all we're proposing. So in other words, if it goes to appeal, it goes to appeal all the previous materials will be submitted as well. And uh, we'll make a determination. Yes. Yeah. 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 When we go to the you're specifically asking about when you go before the arbitrator at the MAPC. It's wide open. There will be new evidence. There will be something that you didn't do, which is cross examination, which always elicits interest in new evidence as well. Well, I cross examined. I went back and forth. Yes, you did. I, I, I'm glad to go over the map on the paragraph. Um, the yeah, well, sure. Just now that we'll fix that up somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different ballgame for me. I usually give homework. I don't do homework. I don't do my homework. appropriateness. Um, the references for Massachusetts general law is fine to state about the paint yeah. and colors, but Reading does not reference mm -hmm. colors. You remember I told you that there was one mistake? That's, That's it. it. All right. Okay. Yeah. Do I get extra credit? You do get extra credit. Yeah. 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 And that's true in 39. Mm -hmm. Should we use the term public way to stay 
consistent with our bylaw. I know we've had issues with that terminology. <coughs> um. That that um, that uh, runway that leads to the parking lot over there is not a public way, as the term public way is typically understood. <coughs> they have a board of selectmen and accepted with the town, uh, accepted by a town meeting vote. That is not what that is. The term public street is. Uh, Oddly, un undefined both in the statute and in our bylaw. Um, uh, but I take it to mean um, uh, something other than a public way, something, I mean, you use two different words, you, you, you uh, um, um, uh, you expect it to mean so something else. There are some examples in the, in the statute of things that are not public ways, things like car parts and, and what have you, um, and uh, that, are, that are not there to be excluded from the concept of public street, but we are left um, um, to our own devices in determining uh, what is and is not a public street. That, that roadway is open to the public, it is used, uh, used by the public, it is clearly not a public way, but it is um, open um, to the public, and um, <coughs> I think it is reasonable to say that the view from the, from the rear um, is something that this commission can take into consideration. The only principal thing that it seems to me that is a concern there is the, the, the HVAC, mm -hmm. um, and um, by way of comparison, um, I had suggested that if, you, if there was going to be an approval, that you include something saying that that needs to be screened. The disapproval, um, you know, that's an additional factor, but it, in the grand scheme of things, it's a pretty, uh, it, you certainly wouldn't, I, I certainly would advise you to disapprove it if that would be only um, item. And you said that strongly. I would, if that was your only objection, I would advise you not to disagree. will only be extended in the form and detail that are acceptable from a public way. But in I our, yeah, um, I believe it's the commission's authority to determine whether the property and certain features are visible from a public way and to, be, and to proceed with the review then appropriate. And I also point out here in 7.3.2.1.0, the term uh, shall include public way, public street, public park, and other public bodies of water. The term public way, however, shall not include the terms of foot path, car path, easement rights, and all that kind of stuff. So, I think it's a, so. I think it's not the most beautifully piece, um, um, drafted piece of, uh, uh, of legislation I've ever seen. Do you, um, did you need that exception? No, no, I'm sorry. Tim and I were on the original board. So okay, well, I'm sorry. It's still not the most beautiful. Somebody else did uh, it. A, because, because it says the definition of public way shall mean, and then the first thing it says is public way, and then adds a whole bunch of other things. So it's sort of circular. And second, that it clearly is intended to mean something more than, than just the public ways that are laid out. You notice that in the, they don't they separately they, they don't define in the, in the statute public way to mean those things. They just say it has to be visible from one of those four things. Mm -hmm. um, that said, we don't really have a definition of public street. It's not 
it's not a term that that appears in the in, in the law very often. They always use the word public way when they mean that. So, but we have a little bit of guidance because we know some things that are excluded from it, and so. Um, I think it's reasonable to say that that drop, that roadway that goes into the um, school property is open to the public and it's more like a street than it is a car path or one of those other things. It's better in the that category than the other. Right, even though one could say it doesn't fit in either category, but um, that's, that's not a useful thing for people want to say. If the town maintains it, is it not then a public way? Well, no, no, no word. Really? Um, a, a public way has to be accepted by town meeting. So, if there, if, without a town meeting vote to, but that doesn't mean it isn't public, because it clearly is public, it's open to the public, public. It's a way. And it's a street. <laughs> like, a, like a street, anyway. <coughs> Any other <coughs> comments that we have? That does bring up the HPA system for both uh, visibility and noise. Uh, Just delete, delete the then house then. and barn. Can't we say the proposal is question of questionable appropriateness? that you intended to 
that were proposed to be done to the housing park were appropriate. Um, and um, then following that, we made final go in approval. We said it was appropriate. And, um, <coughs> It should not have. It, it, this is not one that you can just say. Well, if you disapprove it, then then it's inappropriate. That, that was not, that was not necessary. Should because I don't think that your decision is based on a determination that the that the changes that are in the uh, were are being proposed to me to the house or to the bond is what's troubling you. Right. No, no, that's right. no. Sure. So that's what should be taken. <coughs> So move that the certificate of appropriateness application um, submitted by criterion. And I just use that in quotes because I don't have the full name. Um, for uh, the property at 186-190 Summer Avenue be denied. And, and I may suggest that we further move to instruct town council to <coughs> prepare a decision reflecting that denial in accordance with the conversation that we had this evening. You know. That we, as part of our agreement, we agreed that we would talk together to schedule the hearing on the certificate of hardship and the uh, ADA request. Also, um, we expect there to be a large turnout of people who are relying on this project, so we'd ask you to get the biggest possible venue. A lot of people are, are relying on, on Criterion and will be bitterly disappointed. We understand you're doing what you think you have to do, but. So we, we think it would work best if we have the largest venue the town can supply. Well, are you, are you suggesting something like, like where we hold town meeting? Yes, middle yes, middle exactly. Well, we can ask for it. I understand, I understand. Well, there's several of those possibilities, like Parker again, hope that the staging isn't all up there and stuff like that. <coughs> we also there's, cool there's, there's, there's no place to send the documents and look at stuff. And right. Right. I have a question. If, if the use is not part of the discussion, um, can it be brought up at that point? Um, I would also point out that I've tried to be very, very clear about presenting both sides consistently about that. I know that we, I feel we don't have a lot of jurisdiction over parking. I mean, this, this is an example of parking, signage, they're all controlled by something else. But they affect the setting very dynamically. So I've allowed that discussion to happen. So that we at least hear it. That doesn't mean our decision is based on it. But we are aware of the premise. And I think. But 
Further, with respect to a certificate of hardship, the applicant is, is entitled to present whatever evidence is relevant to demonstrate that a ruling, a disapproval, would rent would cause a hardship, and um, um, it would be pretty much impossible to do so unless unless he was able to say. Um, you know how he proposed to use it, and, and, and why not being able to do so is uh, is a hardship. There is no other way to really present a hardship without discussing the use. Both both for the hardship presentation and the request for reasonable accommodation, uh, the nature of Evergreen's I mean <laughs> Criterion's clients, the nature of Criterion's mission, uh, and what it's doing on the property are are the critical portions of that presentation. So do we close this hearing? <laughs> well, we're at the end of, we can close the hearing with respect to the uh, certificate of property. Um, we are treating this as a single proceeding even though we're going to re-notice it. Um, so the reason we're doing that is so that they don't have to run off to the MAPC and, and file an appeal now. Uh, they can wait until, uh, 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 and give us an opportunity to, uh, uh, to rule on all aspects of their application uh, before deciding what they, what remedies they want to pursue, if any. Um, so, since we're treating this as a single proceeding, we're not closing the hearing entirely. <coughs> just we're close, closing the hearing with respect to the proceeding. Okay. And, and the agreement was that that this vote will not be filed with the town clerk. Is it? Yes. Is it usually what happened? Okay. That's by agreement. So can we agree on a date here? Might be the best while we have our books. So no, also we can come to two sides of the coin. We can probably get a date or two down, but then I got to find out what's available. Of course. So I, I think we can walk away with the date, and then I'll just have to begin to check it out when I get back here. If it's, if it's we, we'd like some time, you know, because this is going to be a, a different kind of endeavor. So we'd like what six weeks. Well, that happily gets us past the end of town meeting season. So, <laughs> so, so I, uh, I, I, I'm with you. Well, he's going to give us a couple of dates, but he can't do dates. He doesn't know what's going to be available. We, we have agreed to extend all this. So, you're going to be noticed. You're going to be noticed. But, um, Mr. Blodgett, or Ray through Mr. Blodgett, I, I, I would ask that the notice, the new notice, does specifically mention the reasonable accommodation request as well as the. Thank you. Good to have you. Uh, um, Bob, Dr. Littleton is uh, is going to be away till the fifteenth. That's good because I've got a meeting with Okay. Mondays work best. Mondays seem to work best for us. The seventeenth to Oh, oh man, will you just get back that day? Well, yeah, but you just come back on yeah, Monday the fifteenth. Monday, June twenty-second. Uh, no, because I'm uh, 22nd, I am coming back from Madison, Wisconsin. Monday. Uh, 29th? June 29th. Oops. I'm uh, not back. Oh, no, that's, 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 that's before uh, the 4th of July. Does it, does it have to be a Monday, or can it be a Wednesday, as it has been at some times, or a Thursday? I think the request was to make it all Thursday. No, can it be a can it be a Wednesday? Tuesdays are all right. My schedule is pretty much on. Could it be what? Could it be Wednesday the seventeenth, for example? 
Of, of June. Of June, yes. On Wednesday? Of what? What? When? When? June? Rosh September. Yeah, no, my calendar. Ramadan. 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 Little friend. Ramadan. Ramadan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, big mystery. Oh, big mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Wednesday the 17th works for us. <laughs> Wednesday? Okay. Okay. Location to be determined? Yep. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 